Welcome to MEM 18003, Use Tools for Precision Work. Welcome to Pertech Learning and Development. This lecture is a supplement to student workbook and other resources made available to you. If you haven't yet done so, pause the video now and download and read the participants workbook. We recommend you don't commence any assessment activities until you've read the entire participants workbook. Let's have a look at your student resources. Keep an eye out for announcements from P Moodle. Visit the resource section regularly as we are constantly uploading resources and reference materials. Just a reminder that we do not announce resource updates and additions. Make it a habit to visit the resource section at least once a week to keep up to date with the latest resources. P Moodle or Moodle is available on your favourite mobile device. The Moodle mobile app is free and available from the Apple Store, Google Apps, etc. If you don't have a desktop publishing program, we recommend LibreOffice. It's free, stable and available for all major operating systems. Google Docs. If you have a Google account, you have access to Google Docs, another alternative to Microsoft Office or LibreOffice. Though you will need an internet connection, but on the plus side, you get 15 gigabytes of online storage. Perfect for storing your course documents and having access to them anywhere. Both LibreOffice and Google Docs enable PDF editing and conversion. Perfect for processing your assignment documents. LibreCAD from the people that make LibreOffice is our recommended 2D CAD package for this course. It's free and has a standard industry interface. You may find it useful in this unit. More on that later. If you haven't yet done so, get yourself a copy of the Fitting and Machining Trade Textbook. I still use this book 45 years after I purchased my first copy. Unfortunately, my original copy fell into a coolant tank. The textbook can be purchased from Hare and Forbes. Pause the video now to record the web address. Information on online and over-the-counter purchases is on their website. Another recommended textbook for this course is the Hydraulics and Pneumatics Technicians and Engineers Guide. This book covers all critical theory around hydraulics and pneumatics. This will be especially useful when you get to year three. YouTube is a valuable resource these days. Keep an eye out in the resource section of P Moodle for recommended videos. One of the practical activities for this unit is to make and scrape a split bush out of brass or bronze. Here's an example of one of the video links in the resource area. The company is Royal Machine Tools. You'll find a link in the resource section of P Moodle. Or pause the video now and record the uh, YouTube address at the bottom of the slide. Any Pertech documents referenced in this lecture are available on PConnect. You will also find any reference documents on PMoodle. Any Pertech components, hoses, adapters, etc. described in this lecture were referenced from the Pertech catalogues. Think, plan, do, review. It's our work smart method. Think, what am I doing? Plan, what do I need? In what order will I be performing the tasks? 
do execute my plan follow my plan review was I successful can I do anything better did something go wrong main lecture topics that will be covered in this lecture section 1 precision and accuracy section 2 precision tools section 3 scraping section 4 broaching section 5 reaming section 6 drilling tools section 7 precision machining and section 8 machine maintenance before we proceed let's do some revision from our measurement unit it is important to know the difference between precision and accuracy and also in this unit we're going to be introducing a new term resolution this can be very confusing because we can be precise but not accurate we can be accurate but not precise we could be neither precise or accurate and we can be precise and accurate what's the difference let's have a look at being precise imagine you have five balls and you have to throw those five balls into the bucket and you get all those five balls into the bucket your throwing is precise you will only be accurate if the bucket was in the right place the easiest way to remember the difference between preciseness and accuracy is think of preciseness as the ability to repeat and accuracy is basically how close I measured or got my arrow or my ball to the intended target now let's look at a micrometer reading example I've taken 10 measurements and I've repeated that measurement 10 times within 0 0.02 millimeters of nominal size so I'm precise with my measurements but the micrometer is damaged and it's out about one millimeter so that means I'm not accurate so I have precision but no accuracy let's look at the precision of a measurement instrument or the ability for it to repeat the measurement over and over again does the quality or cost influence an instruments preciseness look at these two identical micrometers one is more expensive than the other could it be construction the materials the manufacturing methods or is there no difference we know precision is important that is the ability to repeat a measurement what about accuracy how closely does the measurement on the instrument relate to the length master or reference how accurate is our micrometer the only real way to find out is to get the micrometer calibrated or the setting master calibrated so we have something to reference against pictured above is a 25 millimeter mic check set measurements are taken at eight points along the micrometer travel as specified by the ISO standard all eight measurements must be within a tolerance to deem the micrometer accurate pictured above are examples of setting masters that are shipped with micrometers most measurement tools will be shipped with some type of tool for setting the zero or checking the range depending on the standards that you're working under the setting standards will have to be periodically sent for calibration or checking this will give your micrometer and measurement traceability in the event of a problem or legal issue when where and how often do I get my measurement devices calibrated this will depend on what standards you're working under for example SAE DIN ISO and of course what's outlined in your organization's quality system or your organization's SOPs 
or standard operating procedures. NADA is an example of a peak body or an organisation that can assist and advise you in your calibration needs. NADA certified organisations or businesses can calibrate measurement instruments for you. You can download the calibration reference equipment table from NADA from PMoodle. Let's look at our 125 to 150 millimeter micrometer. Here we can see that NADA recommends that the micrometers are calibrated or checked every five years. They also recommend that the micrometer is checked against the setting standard every month, but most of us will check that against the setting standard as soon as we take it out of the box before we even take our first measurement. NADA recommends that the setting standards should be measured after the first three years and then every six years after that. When you purchased the micrometer, did it come with a calibration certificate? Well, depending on who I purchased it from and the brand and the make, I might need to send it out immediately for calibration. Check your particular standard for instructions on how to deal with new equipment. Let's introduce a new term, resolution. Resolution is basically how small the numbers go on the instrument. Here we can see that the display goes to the third decimal place, 0 0.001. If it was a micrometer scale type micrometer, in other words, how small do the engraved ticks go down to? Let's take a look at these bore gauges. Here we can see they quote a different value for resolution and accuracy. Just because an instrument can display microns, it does not mean it can measure microns. Resolution is not accuracy. And precision will rely on the skill of the measurer and features on the device, like this one that's got a ratchet thimble, so we can exert the same pressure every time we do a measurement which increases the precise precision or the precise measurement. This pistol grip bore gauge improves precision by the use of a pretension spring force during the measurement process, thus further eliminating human error. Accuracy is achieved by setting the bore gauge against the calibrated setting ring. Note the temperature rating stamped on the setting ring. Another type of bore gauge used in production manufacturing environments is the air gauge or the air bore gauge. It uses a difference in air pressure against the plug in the mating part to detect any variations in size. As you can see with the pistol bore gauge, calibrated setting masters are used to set the bottom and top size. And according to NADA, the setting rings should be checked after the first three years and then every six years. 25.001 is stamped on this setting ring. Therefore, I would put my bore gauge inside the ring and set the electronic display on the bore gauge to 25.001. Therefore, my bore gauge would be referenced against the setting ring and then any other measurements taken by the bore gauge would be referenced against the setting ring. Most measurements instruments will have a more precise relative or variation. Here we can see on the left garden variety vernier height gauge, on the right hand side a fully programmable height gauge. Other more precise and accurate measurement devices are coordinate measuring machines and laser scanning machines. And as with the other measurement tools, these devices also are checked against calibrated masters.
Even these high-tech machines will also have to be periodically calibrated or checked. Refer to the NADA calibration reference table for recommended periodic calibrations for your specific machine or device. Special tools and methods will assist you in getting more precise measurements. Take some time to investigate what accessories are available to you. Section 3. Scraping. Scraping is a process of providing an oil retaining texture and increased surface contact area to mating surfaces within a mechanical device. Hand scraping is the process of using either a manual or motor driven scraping blade to remove very small amounts of metal. Scraping increases surface contact area, thus increasing machine rigidity. With scraping, the amount of contact over a given area of two mating components can exceed 50%. Scraping is sometimes performed for cosmetic reasons and for when machining is not practicable. Pictured is a power driven scraper fitted with a replaceable carbide tip. In the age of high tech equipment and CNC machinery, hand scraping of mating surfaces might seem a little bit antiquated. Advances in materials and the use of linear bearings has assigned scraping to specialist and enthusiast applications. During the Industrial Revolution, and especially in the age of steam before roller bearings were invented or used in larger machine tools, scraping of slides and bearings was the only way to ensure precision and lubrication to moving parts. Scrapers are made from high carbon steel or tool steel. Attention should be paid to hardness over tempering and edges should be sharp and fault free. Types of scrapers. Firstly, let's look at the flat scraper. Looks like a chisel with a flared end. All scrapers are fitted with a wooden handle. Flat scrapers are used for scraping flat surfaces. Another common type of scraper is the half round scraper. This has a curved and tapered end and of course fitted with a wooden handle. Half round scrapers are used for scraping curved surfaces like bearings and bushings or bearing journals. Pictured here is a Split bearing, scraper, bearing blue, and the master. The master is used to apply the bearing blue to the bearing surface. A master can be a precision cylinder or the mating shaft that's going to be fitted onto the bearing. Another type of scraper, the most common Scraper is the three square or three corner scraper, sometimes called the triangular scraper. The triangular scraper or three corner scraper is used for scraping curved surfaces like bearings or bearing journals and is used for removing burrs from holes or corners. Most tradespeople will make their own triangular scraper from an old broken file. It is one of the most common deburring tools found in a engineering tradesperson's toolbox. Commercially available triangular deburring tools are available with throwaway tips and plastic handles. Let's have a look at scraping a flat surface. In this example, I'll be using a master to transfer the bearing blue to the part that I'll be scraping. I proceeded to smear the bearing blue onto the master, then I transferred the master 
onto the part to reveal the high spots. Scraping the surface. Holding the scraper at about 35 degrees, I will proceed to take 15 millimeter long cuts in a diagonal 45 degree pattern, reducing the high spots. I will repeat the bluing and scraping until I have achieved about 50% of the area covered in a uniform blue pattern. The finished surface. On the left, we can see the uniform pattern indicating that I've achieved the 50% surface area from scraping. On the right, we can see the typical surface texture of a scraped flat surface. Let's look at an example of scraping a curved surface. New bearings have been machined for the gearbox. They've been fitted, now require scraping. The journals of the gearbox drive shaft will be used as the master. Bearing blue has been applied to the shaft journals in preparation of the shaft being placed in the bearings. The blued shaft was repositioned in the bushes. Witness marks were left at the high spots when the shaft was removed. The high spots were scraped. The bluing and scraping process was repeated until 50% of the surface area was covered in a uniform speckled blue pattern. Don't forget the top half of the bearings and the gearbox. Section 4. Broaching. Broaching is a machining process that uses a toothed tool called a broach to remove material. It has a similar cutting action to a saw but is pushed or pulled through or over a workpiece. Broaches are commonly made from high-speed steel and carbide. Linear broaches can produce symmetrical and asymmetrical profiles in pre-drilled through holes. Broaches can be pushed or pulled through pre-drilled holes vertically or horizontally. In this example we can see an upper press is used to push the brooch through the part, creating a keyway. Brooches have a set cutting depth. In this example, the broaching shims are used to increase the depth of the brooch every time the brooch is passed through the hole. The broaching bush keeps the brooch aligned and straight. Hydraulically operated Horizontal and vertical broaching presses are commonly used in mass production situations. Sometimes a roughing and finishing broach are utilised depending on the shape and the amount of material to be removed and the design of the broach. Here we have an example of a broach being pulled through the part. Note the utilisation of cutting fluid during this operation. In this example, we have a broaching tool being pulled through a part to size a hole. As the brooch is being pulled through the hole, each tooth on the brooch takes a predetermined amount of material until the final size is achieved. Chip breakers and specific angles are ground onto the brooch to suit the material that's being cut. Brooches can be purchased as standard sizes and profiles, but most commonly brooches are custom ground or manufactured to customers' specifications. Although each tooth on a brooch has a specific chip load, the chip load gets progressively smaller as the profile gets bigger. External brooching or face brooching is another common broaching application. What about broaching blind holes or external profiles? 
The rotary brooch or wobble tool is another type of brooching. The term wobble tool basically describes its operation. A hole is pre-drilled in the workpiece, then a tool with a specific profile is set slightly off center and rotated, then introduced into the workpiece. The wobbling rotary motion transfers the shape of the wobble tool into the hole. Rotary brooch configurations usually consist of an arbor to suit the specific machine tool and a tool. As with linear brooches, they can be purchased as standard profiles or custom sizes and or profiles. In this example, the rotary brooch is fitted on a vertical milling machine. The pre-drilled hole and finished hex holes are visible. Basic configurations, clearance angles and design details for brooches can be located in the machinery's handbook. Section 5. Reaming. What is a reamer? A reamer is a cutting tool that is used to size a pre-drilled hole. They are size specific and manufactured to standard sizes. Reamers are often custom made to suit specific sizes and applications. Holes are usually pre-drilled about 0.25 to 0.4 millimeters undersize for the reaming operation. A surface finish of 0.2 to 3.2 RA is achievable. Rule of thumb feeds and speeds. Reamer RPM is about 50% the drilling RPM and reamer feed rate is about double the drilling feed rate. Of course, please refer to the reamer manufacturer's data sheet for exact cutting data. The tolerance class for reaming is between IT6 and IT9. Reamers can be hand operated or used in machine tools. Reamers can also be used for maintenance and deburring. Reamers. Advantages. Reaming produces accurately sized holes. Reaming produces a predictable surface finish. Reaming can be done manually or on a machine tool. Disadvantages. Large tool inventory required to cover all sizes. Custom manufacturers required for non-standard sizes and you're going to need spare parts and replacements when they get blunt. Reamers will not straighten holes and they can't remove much material. And of course, the sizes aren't adjustable. Types of reamers. Chucking reamers, or sometimes referred to as machine reamers, commonly used in machine tools. These are made of high-speed steel and sometimes solid carbide. They come with straight shanks and Morse taper shanks. Rose type chucking reamers are closely related to the standard chucking reamer, but they are specially ground to resist bending and able to take deeper cuts. They come in tapered or parallel shanks for use in machine tools. They're available in high speed steel and solid carbide. Machine bridge reamers are usually used with portable power tools mainly on fabricated work. Machine jig reamers have a cylindrical section behind the flutes so it can run inside a bush for accuracy and rigidity. Machine jig reamers are used on machine tools and are available in high speed steel and solid carbide. Hand reamers. As the name states, they are manually operated. They have a square end which can be driven with a tap wrench. Specialty reamers, like the socket reamer for Morse tapers. Shell reamers are an alternative to having large reamer inventories. They have an arbor with interchangeable reaming heads. These are for use on machine tools. The heads are available in high-speed steel and carbide. 
The taper pin reamer is a close relative to the socket reamer, designed for reaming taper pinholes. These can be hand driven or machine driven, available in high speed steel and of course carbide. An expanding reamer is an adjustable reamer designed for manual use. Each reamer has a specific hole, diameter range. There is a square at the end of the shank so it can be driven with a tap wrench for example. With modern machine tools and tooling, the reamer has become a little obsolete for most mass production and jobbing shop applications. The ability to adjust size and quickly replace cutting edges and grades makes boring the more practical option. Reamers still have a place on semi-automatic and automatic machines and some manual reaming jobs like taper reaming, etc. Section 6. Drilling Tools Firstly, let's look at the humble drill bit or twist drill bit. This is a specially designed alloy rod, when rotated, removes material, forming a hole. There are many parts to a drill bit, but as with a turning tool, specific lead angles and clearances need to be ground to suit the material that we're cutting. Drill bits can be made from high-speed steel, carbide, or incorporate replaceable cutting inserts. Refer to the tooling manufacturer's data sheet or the machinery's handbook for the correct drill configuration for your particular application. Cutting tool alloys and coating. Most drills are made from high-speed steel. As with the tool geometry, the grade of high-speed steel alloy can be selected to suit the material that we're cutting. Certain special coatings are also available. This improves wear resistance and resists buildup of materials on cutting edges. Drill bits can be purchased individually or in sets. The sets can be one millimeter increments, half millimeter increments, 0.1 millimeter increments, or tap drill sizes. Drill bits are available in high-speed steel, carbide, and custom sizes can also be manufactured for special applications. Pictured here on the drill chart, we can see all the standard drill sizes that are available in metric and in millimeters. The inch system has number and letter drills to cater for inch tap drill sizes and reaming drill sizes. The pictured above is a number drill set. Pictured, we can see that the letter A drill corresponds to 234 thousandths of an inch, which just happens to be 5.94 millimeters. And yes, a letter or number drill might correspond to a drill size for a metric reamer. So it's important to have your drill size charts always handy. Drills and drill sets are available with Morse taper shanks for use on machine tools like drill presses, mills, and in the tailstock of laves. Note that you might have to sleeve the taper to fit your specific machine. Reduced shank drills. Reduced shank drills come in sets and individually. Be careful with this type of drill bit, as chucks have a capacity for a reason and they're usually matched to machine horsepower. The excessive chip load of a reduced shank drill may cause a motor to stall or a power tool to grab and cause injury. Core drills. A core drill is a type of drill used to drill out cast holes in castings. They can have four, six or eight flutes with a thick core which resists bending and deflection. Core drills cannot start holes due to their large web area. Drill geometry. As with turning and milling tools, drills are ground and configured for cutting different materials. As we can see above, comparing the helix angle of a standard drill to a low and high helix drill bit. Refer to your tool manufacturer's data sheet or machinery's handbook for specific tool configurations. 
other drilling tools, specialty drills, center drills, counter bores, step drills, just to name a few, all available in sets, individually, in carbide and high speed steel. Insert drills gives us the convenience of interchangeable cutting edges. Changing the grade of insert enables us to drill multiple types of material. Some insert drills have through coolant capabilities. Gun drills for deep hole drilling. Gun drills are straight fluted drills which allow cutting fluid to be injected through the drill's hollow body to the cutting face. They are used for deep drilling, depth of diameter usually 300 to 1. More is possible. A gun drill is constructed from a hollow alloy tube with a brazed carbide head. There are indexable insert versions available also. Hole cutters, annular cutters, rotor brooches. This tool goes by many names. They are used to produce holes in situ on items like I-beams on the construction sites, for example. Pictured above is a portable magnetic drill used to mount the annular cutter. The annular cutter produces a slug similar to a hole saw which is ejected when the cutter is withdrawn from the hole. Hole saws. Hole saws are available in sets or individually, in high speed steel or carbide tipped. As with the annulus cutter, a slug is produced from the hole cutting operation. The slugs can be ejected via a spring or manually. The trepanning tool, a very close relative to the hole saw, but uses a single tip and can be adjusted for diameter. A boring head can be used for trepanning holes or manufacturing holes, or boring out a hole or finish sizing a hole. Boring heads have the advantage of being able to adjust the size, cutting conditions and control things like surface finish, etc. Milling cutters. Milling cutters can produce holes. Slot drills can start holes, but as we can see with the end mill, with the absence of any cutting edges in the center, end mills can only finish size holes. Section seven, precision machining. What is precision machining? We know the difference between precision and accuracy now. We can say that precision is the ability to repeat a movement or a measurement to a close tolerance. What factors make a machine or a process precise? The quality of the machine, the construction of the machine, the process that we're using and the operator skill or a combination of all of the above. Quality. What determines quality? Is it the country of manufacture? Is it the company that made the machine, the reputation? Is it the cost? Here we can see two machining centers of the same capacity made in different countries. There's a considerable difference in price. Is the more expensive machine more precise or and reliable than the cheaper machine? Further investigation needs to be done. Another factor determining precision is the construction of the machine. How is the machine constructed? What components are used to build the machine? Here we've got an example of concrete filled machine beds to give us stability and rigidity. Normalizing castings. Was the casting normalized? In other words, left out in the rain for six months before it was brought in and the machining process commenced. Is the machine tool manufacturer utilizing linear slides or box slides in their machine construction? All these factors dictate the repeatability and the stability of the machine tool. Another factor determining precision 
is the process. What machining process are we using? Are we using abrasive machining? Or are we using chip type machining? Remember from a previous machining unit that abrasive machining is quite advantageous when the components have been heat treated or hardened. What about operator skill? What happens when we put an unskilled operator on a high precision machine or put a highly skilled operator on a poor quality machine? There's a lot of factors to take into account. Experience the familiarity with the equipment, familiarity with the process, feel for the process. What's the weather like? The humidity, the temperature, variations in material, variations in cutting tools, incentive, professionalism, workmanship and pride. All these factors need to be considered and affect the quality and precision of a component. What can we do to improve precision on a machine tool? Fitting digital readouts can assist improving the preciseness of our machining operation. Digital readouts can be fitted to any type of machine tool. They have numerous built-in functions to assist us in improving precision, things like tool offset recording and tool wear compensation. Digital readouts also enable us to pre-program positions and the digital reader can also be used for measuring the item. Digital readouts can be fitted to many different types of machine tools. Here's our basic vertical mill and center lathe. Pictured here is a cylindrical grinder with a digital readout. We can see here it's only one axis, obviously the diameter and the jig borer. We can see that there's three axis on that machine. So we have a three axis digital readout uh, fitted to it. Precision machining is usually associated with grinding. The abrasive machining process enables us to remove very small amounts of material down to the micrometer. This is due to the surface finish achieved from grinding and the very small abrasive grits used in the manufacture of the grinding wheels. It's important to remember, as with the chip type cutting processes, the grinding wheels need to be matched to the material that we're machining. Internal grinding and surface grinding are also commonly performed grinding operations. Universal grinders are also commonplace in workshops. These can be set as external and internal grinders. CNC machines, computer controlled machines. These are machines that can be controlled by a computer program, thus eliminating human error and automating the process. A 3D printer is a type of CNC machine and uses the same programming language that industrial CNC machines use. CNC lathes and CNC mills are commonplace in engineering workshops and manufacturing facilities. Any type of machine tool can be converted into a CNC machine. Borers, grinders, drilling machines. CNC machines can be integrated into a large manufacturing cell fed by conveyors and robots. Even measurement machines can be computer controlled. The code to drive CNC machines can be handwritten, directly entered into the machine control or created using a graphical interface like a CAD CAM software package. CAD CAM software speeds up and automates the program generation process and makes it possible to create extremely complex and long toolpaths. Section 8 Machine and Equipment Maintenance A good maintenance plan ensures reliability 
and protects your investment in equipment. Let's look at the top five general machine and equipment maintenance tips. Scheduled servicing. With any machine or piece of equipment, the manufacturer will recommend scheduled maintenance or scheduled maintenance tasks on the equipment. This will ensure they are fit for purpose and reliable and always available. Take note, warranty may be conditional to programmed maintenance or scheduled maintenance. A simple oil change or belt adjustment may be the only difference between reliability and disaster. Check the lubrication. Check the oil levels. Grease and oil ensure lubrication and keeps rust at bay. Always use the correct oil for the application. Always refer to the machine tool or equipment manufacturer's instruction manual for the correct grade of oil. Tool maintenance. Not just machines need maintenance, but the tools need to be maintained also. Things like cutoff wheels, consumables, measurement devices. These must be in good condition and stored safely. They can also be damaged during transportation and storage, so care must be taken. Cutting tools, drills, milling cutters, arbors, the inserts, they all need to be carefully inspected, handled and stored. Cutting tool inserts, for example, can look very similar but have completely different applications. Installing used or damaged inserts or the wrong insert could be disastrous, so appropriate inventory management system will be necessary. Checking machine settings and alignment. Let's ask some questions. Who used the machine last? Did they change any settings? Was there an incident that could cause the equipment not to operate properly? Is there a procedure in place on how machines and equipment are to be left after use? Let's look at taper turning on a lathe between centers as an example. If the operator does not return the tailstock to the machine center line, the next operator who wants to turn something parallel between centers might assume the machine's ready to use and create a taper in their job. A test procedure, a test measurement, a test cut, crimp, weld, etc. should be done first to determine the status of the equipment or machinery. It's not just the tools that require correct maintenance, handling and storage. The accessories are just as important as the tools. Damage, misuse, rust can contribute to the degradation of valuable machine tool accessories. Clean, inspect, oil and store the accessories appropriately. Detecting faulty accessories early enables you to isolate and replace them efficiently. Nipping problems in the bud. Common sense plays a big role here. Strange noises strange smells, excessive load on the amp meter can all be clues to faulty equipment and impending disaster. Where do I start with maintenance or maintenance plans for my machine or equipment? The service or operator's manual should contain information on cyclic and preventative maintenance. Contact the dealer or supplier if this information is not available. Ask them what standard parts you should have in stock or what standard parts they keep in stock in the event of a breakdown. Maintenance contracts. Does your machine dealer offer a maintenance contract or extended warranty on the piece of equipment or machinery you're purchasing from them? What are the terms? What are the conditions? Do they supply the warranty or the maintenance contract directly or do they use a contractor? What is the minimum wait time for a service engineer to come out on site? These are important questions to ask. Maintenance tracking software. If you have a lot of machinery, you may need to implement a maintenance tracking software system. The software keeps track of maintenance, spare parts, inventory, and a detailed maintenance history on each 
piece of equipment and machinery. You can also contract this task out as there are specialist maintenance firms that can manage all of your maintenance records and machine maintenance for you. And don't forget, there's always a spreadsheet program. A special shout out to Heron Forbes, AKA Machinery Warehouse, for letting us use their images from their website. Don't forget to visit their website. They have an incredible range of tools and equipment at really good prices. It's basically a one-stop shop for all your engineering requirements. They also have a showroom in every major state in Australia. Another shout out is to Colin from Cutting Edge Engineering for also letting us use photos and videos from their website and YouTube channel. Don't forget to check out, like and subscribe to Cutting Edge Engineering's YouTube channel. He's got some great machining and fitting tutorials with some great examples.